morning, everyone. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, let's tell them, Jamie and Katie, uh, I grew up uh, on the Minnesota side, about 40 miles from here, over by Rochester, a little tiny town, 300 people, and uh, it's always a pleasure to come back over here. We get over here a lot to go trout fishing, and I was really excited. We're staying at the Rabbits and we're having a drip, dripless area restoration uh, conference there today. So it was really fun to see that going on. Uh, as Bryce said, I'm the executive director uh, of HBI. I'm also a faculty member in our public and nonprofit administration department. Uh, and one of the main things that we do as faculty members and have to do is to do research on the nonprofit sector. And we're very committed uh, to trying to make what we do as practical uh, as possible. And a fun way we've been able to do that is to bring our scholars and our faculty and other scholars across the country and world to various communities across the state. And that's what we're doing this here today. Um, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to have with us uh, a person who's done some of these with us before. Uh, she's a proven commodity, and so we bring her back, uh, mainly because she has a really excellent message about a topic that I, is of interest to all of you. Uh, her name is Elizabeth Seary, and she's a faculty member at SUNY Albany. Uh, she has her PhD from Georgia State University, and she worked under one of the premier scholars in nonprofits, uh, Dennis Young, who's a wonderful human being and also a heck of a scholar. Uh, she has a very impressive publication record, uh, in particular given that she only graduated with her PhD in 2015. She has eight journal articles, two edited books, and 18 chapters. That's a lot in a very short period of time. So we're really excited to have Elizabeth here uh, to talk to you a little bit about uh, this particular topic up on the board, a really important one, and I'm going to turn it over to Elizabeth right now. Well, thank you so much for, for having me here. I, I feel like I almost didn't make it. I ate so much walleye at Dickers last night <laughs> that I entered kind of a food coma there for a little while, but, uh, but I did make it, which is fantastic. Um, and uh, let's make sure I've got this here. <clears throat> All right. So I must admit I was intimidated when I was asked to come here because most of the time that I talk about overhead and overhead costs, I am talking to rooms full of nonprofit workers um, and nonprofit executives. And so I thought, well, my first thought was, okay, so what? What am I going to say to a room? And then as I started thinking, I'm like, this is an incredible opportunity because you, more than any other audience that I have talked about overhead to, have the power to really make a difference in changing this conversation. So we'll spend a little bit of time today talking about what the what we call the starvation cycle is. We'll talk about what overhead costs are, and then we'll talk about what y'all as funders can do in order to make sure that nonprofits are putting aside enough money to actually be healthy, functional organizations. So you'll notice I said the word y'all. That's because despite the fact that I'm currently in upstate New York, I spent a lot of my time in Texas. I'm headed back there in the fall. Um, but I was actually born just down river in Moline. So every once in a while, if, if my eye kind of drifts outside, you'll see that kind of half second, ah, oh, okay. uh, but then I'll bring myself right back, I promise. So what is the overhead starvation cycle? Now, Jesse Lisi and I, uh, who is my co-author on this project, we didn't coin the phrase. That was done by some people working with Bridgespan uh, about a little over 10 years ago. But what we did was uh, we looked for it in the population of nonprofits in the United States to really see whether it was a thing. Is overhead, spending on overhead, is it really going down across all nonprofits in the United States? We considered it unlikely, but when we actually got into the data, we found that in fact it was happening. So this is back in kind of 1985, so the late 80s, we had, we were spending about a little over 23% on overhead, not profit work. Then we see this steep drop off 
in spending on opiates. And so we thought to ourselves, all right, so, so why did this happen? And what does this mean? So first, we started digging in a little bit more, thinking maybe, maybe this is just happening in one particular side of the nonprofit. Maybe it's just the really, really big ones that are having this. But what we found was, and you'll see that the gray dots are the average in 1998, and the blue dots were the average in 2003, so just five years. Just five years. And we'll start at zero dollars in revenue all the way up to 145 million. And we see that for almost every single size point, this is a phenomenon that happened. So it was happening to all sizes of nonprofits. And it was happening in all subsectors. Whether we were talking about the arts, which is kind of this top line, or whether we're talking about human services. Very recently, I've been involved in research that is starting to look at other countries. Is this something that is just happening in the U.S.? Well, this is actually a chart from a recent study on Germany, where they have found a similar behavior. And very recently, just a couple months ago, I presented some work looking at the um, nonprofit starvation cycle in Canada. And we have found evidence of it there as well. So what is this phenomenon that is present not only all over the US, but apparently all over the world, except for the UK? And I'm getting to the bottom of that. And I'll tell you in another six months when that research is done, what's what's happening. But we're everywhere but the UK. Why is this happening? So, so how did we get to this spot of decreasing these overhead costs? First, who here has heard the term overhead costs? So the reason that the term overhead costs is so popular, despite technically not having a solid accounting meeting, is for a couple of reasons. The first is that the Availability of information has become a lot easier to access. So we can log on to GuideStar, Get Not Standard, um, or any other number of organizations online, download some 990s, and figure out the numerical fraction that will tell us what their overhead rate is. And we've been told that in order for an organization to be good, that they need to be minimizing that overhead rate. Now, despite the fact that this kind of information is easy to access, the overhead rate has become a proxy for something we don't have a lot of information on, and that's impact. Real impact is hard to measure. Think about the first presentation that Liz just did, all the focus groups and all of the data that was coming in and all of those indices. That takes a lot of work. Getting an actual impact, and you're very fortunate that you've got a group and you're working on that. But many donors in the US don't have reports like that on the nonprofits they're thinking about giving to. So they get online, they download that 990, they put together that fraction, and they say, you know what? Overhead is the best proxy I've got for effectiveness. And it's just flat wrong. But <clears throat> it's the way that we're going. So uh, that has caused a great deal of problem. Also, highly publicized nonprofit scandals. Newspapers love good scandals, especially if it comes from the social sector. So, uh, and every single time something like this pops up, it makes the struggle for the rest of us much, much more difficult. Every time you hear about a, a for-profit or a commercial company gone bad, someone makes a bad decision. Um, Enron, I went to undergrad at Texas A&M. I was an economist, loved natural resource economics. All the little natural resource economists wanted to grow up and work for Enron. That stopped, fortunately, um, uh, before. Uh, I didn't get there. That was a, that was a good move. 
Um, but the, but generally we don't hear about the for-profit scandals as much as we hear about the non-profit. And so we have highly, highly tuned systems of accountability, whether it is to the government, whether it is to our foundation funders, um, but everything that we do is tracked in order to make sure that we are being accountable, that we're being good stewards, that we're following through. So these scandals have increased the amount of oversight, which has generated additional um, work for that overhead to actually cover, but we can't cover it. So that's kind of the irony in this, is that with all of this additional oversight, actually managing all of this reporting should have pushed up overhead. But it's actually just nonprofit workers having to do more with less funds. And then we have increased professionalization. Now when I say professionalization, I do not mean in any way that professionalized workers or professionalized nonprofit management are better than only professionalized management. It's simply a way of saying where you got your training from. So in the University of Albany, a lot like uh, University of Wisconsin Milwaukee, we have degrees like graduate certificates. Then it's just a five-course sequence where students who are in the field and uh, do direct service delivery all day. They have been promoted to the point that they now have to run the organization. And they haven't had any classes on that yet. So they took all of their school learning how to be a great caseworker or a great services provider. How to read or put together the financial statements or put together an impact report. And so they go to school to learn those things and they come out with a degree or a certification. And so that's really what I mean by professionalization, especially on the, the internal side. So one of the downsides to, to professionalization is that we start looking for these easy kinds of metrics. This is especially true if you have come through on the business side of things. And that's the funny thing about nonprofits is that because we are trying to deliver public goods in the body of a private kind of organization, that you can find these kinds of programs, nonprofit training programs, in the universities, sometimes in the School of Government Public Policy, sometimes in the School of Business, sometimes in standalone kind of policies, all sorts of places. But with this kind of internal professionalization, you have people that are primed coming out saying, you know what, we need to be efficient and effective. But especially if you went and got your lessons at a business school, you may not have a good understanding of how to bring efficiency and effectiveness into the nonprofit sector and actually find a way to measure it the way that Liz showed us how to measure it earlier. And then we have external pressure. A lot of markets that nonprofits work in have, are what we call mixed. So not only are there nonprofits, there's for profits, there's low profits, there's all sorts of different types of organizations. Uh, one of my uh, students right now is writing a, a dissertation, so 200, 400 page paper. Um, on a market in upstate New York on uh, EMS agencies. So if you need an ambulance, the organization that turns up or comes that comes to, to get you might be for profit, it might be non profit, it might be state. Kind of a peculiar thing. But because of all of that mixed competition, again, we feel those efficiency slim down forces. I have a teenage truck, so I'm well aware that young girls are bombarded with the message that they need to be slim and, and, and skinny, and, and it's just as harmful as, as 
send those messages are for our girls, we set up a system where our nonprofits are getting the exact same message. That you need to be slim, skinny, efficient, as little overhead as you can. And that's a good thing. So what the starvation cycle is, is that this is actually a feedback loop where you've got this competitive pressure. The competitive pressure is going to lead to misleading reporting because academics have found that some nonprofits will try and bend the numbers so that they look skinnier than they actually are. And this feeds into unrealistic donor expectations. So there are definitely donors out there that will say, well, if you're spending more than 5% on overhead, I'll pass. And then this just kind of keeps going in a circle. So what exactly is overhead? Well, so if you ask your accountant, they'll probably just is this a word that can mean any number of things? Like the word efficient. So there's a discussion on whether or not overhead should include fundraising. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Does it include all indirect costs, which is a technical term? Well, sometimes. What about full costs? This is actually a concept that is relatively new that includes not only overhead, but the, what they call growth capacity. So for example, pricing in the nonprofit sector. I was just uh, talking about pricing the other day with, uh, with someone, in the, with a practitioner, and they said, well, what is the best way to uh, talk about, make sure that I get the same amount of money to provide a service that a for-profit company does? And I said, well, you need to start talking about pricing. Because think about pharmaceuticals. They are so expensive because for the price of the medicine that you're buying, you are funding research and development, R&D, into other medications. When was the last time that you were able to charge anything as a nonprofit with a piece of it going to R&D? Many government contracts don't even cover indirect, much less R&D. So this is what the term full cost means. So we're going to talk about a couple definitions today that I would consider are more important than some of the others. Uh, one of them is what you're going to find on the IRS Form 990. One of them is about uh, what you'll find at uh, ratings agencies. We'll talk about federal guidelines, and then we'll talk about what's often used in state contracting. Because the deal is, there is a difference between what nonprofits have to report to the federal government as overhead, and what nonprofits have to report to the state as overhead. Because the definitions are often entirely different. So thinking about definitions, this goes back to the study I did with Jesse Lee. So this is the overhead ratio that we were using right here. We bumped in administrative expenses and fundraising. Now you'll notice when you break them into pieces, fundraising actually went up a little bit. And administrative expenses had an even steeper drop. When we dug into even further, what was kind of bearing most of that cut, was it officer wages? Most of that cut was being worn by staff wages. So the effect that this was having was actually compressing the people that were responsible for delivery. So overhead, if we take out the fundraising part, and if we're looking at the 990, which is right there, you'll see that uh, there's a chance to 
take each line item cost, like transportation, and you break it into three different pieces. Management in general, <coughs> fundraising, and program. So the 990 makes it easy. So the type of cost, you label it, so, and that's called administration. Indirect can be a little bit broader. It includes costs that are not tied to a specific project. So, not all management and administration costs are indirect. Not all indirect costs are management and administration. And there's kind of a quick and dirty way to calculate indirect that the government uses. And that essentially is a percentage of what are called modified total direct costs. And that's very different than that 990 labeling administrative exercise. So this is the instructions for the Form 990. You don't have to read it. It's, you can go home, download any 990, and uh, the, the instructions for it will be here. It includes things like um, the cost of board director meetings, general legal and investment management services, insurance, important thing to have. So these are what get labeled on that 990. Look that right there. And even though you can't see it, I'll tell you, this is the total column. Program, management, and fundraising. But then let's talk about those federal guidelines. So, if any of the nonprofits that you're working with have a federal contract, then they have to, one, they might have a negotiated rate, which means they are large enough to have the capacity to sit down with someone in the federal government and over a period of several months negotiate a rate that is acceptable for them to have for overhead. Or, if that isn't the case, they can take what is called a de minimis rate and ask for 10% of overhead. So, that's the 10% of modified total direct costs. So the federal government, in this case, is a lot more generous than a lot of states. Because they say, if you're not powerful enough to negotiate a rate with us, then you can ask for 10%, and that'll be okay. Now, state rates, though, are very different. I had the opportunity to work with the state of New York because they were, they wanted to test drive a plan to have a de minimis rate, very similar to the federal government, in the state of New York. One of the things that we found was this is going to be very difficult because most state contracts do the 990 way of labeling things as management administrative not the federal government way. And just think, if any of the organizations that you're funding have both state and federal money, think about the amount of time that people are having to do all of this paperwork in order to secure these funds and manage these funds. Then we have the ratings agency. I was, and this is kind of my clown space down there in the corner. Uh, Charity Navigator brought me in on their financial measures task force to update what they were using to uh, evaluate how many stars you got on Charity Navigator. Uh, this was a while back, like five or so years ago. Um, and what my main concern was was that the only way that you could get a perfect rating. Um, was if you had 0% overhead. And we were like, well, just hold up one moment here. Uh, so uh, by the end of the uh, 
financial measures overhaul. Um, we instead started paying it to your peer organizations. So if you were in the, um, I think it was a camera for the core mile or a quintile, but if you were, so it's still, you still got more points if you were skinnier and you had a, a, a lower overhead rate, but at least it wasn't more tiles and you could get that perfect rating um, even if you had some overhead, which is uh, expensive. Um, now, the funny thing about Sharing Navigator is that they um, were a part of the overhead plan, which was uh, involved guide stars, involved some foundations, getting together and kind of making a very public stand on knowing that this was destructive and acknowledging their role in, uh, in the starvation cycle. Um, and so as part of that, Sharing Navigator said, well, what we really want to do is measure impact like was talked about earlier. But then just a couple months ago, I got a call from Jerry down here. said, you know what? That whole measuring impacts thing is kind of hard. We might be reassembling the financial measures task force for an update. Are you interested? I said, yes, of course, but, uh, but, uh, but yeah, so, uh, so they have accepted their responsibility for part of it, but the work is not totally done. You're still being rewarded for having the lowest overhead. And this is from the overhead mix. So it was GuideStar, which is now a part of Candid, uh, Better Business Bureau, and Sharing Navigator, and then several other signatories. And so what does this mean for y'all? What does this mean for farmers? Well, so there have been some recommendations. So this is actually from the Overhead Net website, and they have kind of a column of recommendations for funders, some of which are pretty kind of self-involved if you ask me, like, you know, uh, be sure you read the Overhead Net. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Helpful. Um, but, but it emphasizes doing things like getting beyond the numbers. So looking at impact, uh, looking at additional information. This, it recommends looking at the OMB circular. So that's, that's the federal document that talks about that 10% de minimis. Like, if I read that, you may really enjoy that. I would make reading the OMB circular the last one thing on your list. Um, unless you're really getting a tax, a tax call. Um, but, uh, but there are certainly things that can be done. And there are definitely foundations that are making very strong stands on their position on overhead. So, um, especially the Ford Foundation uh, now allows up to 20% um, on, their, uh, on their operational grant. And then there are several places that now have capacity building grants that are not programmatic, that are designed specifically to boost the internal capacity of the nonprofits that they're working with. Whether this is something that is to help them build out some kind of IT infrastructure, whether this is to have additional training, there's, there's a lot of movement toward understanding that nonprofits are, they have to be, if they're going to continue delivering services into the future, they have to actually be healthy, functional organizations full of healthy, functional people. And so there has started to be steps toward funding overhead as either part of programmatic grants or as their own specific, as their own kind of separate uh, class of grants. So Bridgespan uh, has also kind of gone back uh, and revisited, and they also have their own recommendations, uh, which you don't have. You can't read it up here. Um, I think they're uh, a little bit more practical. Um, and they include things like offering flexible enterprise level support in your granting, um, outcomes funding, so taking information like we were able to get earlier and saying, you know what, it's not so much about your overhead rates, it's about the impact that you're actually creating. The overhead uh, starvation cycle will cease 
when we finally have enough information to actually understand true impact, and we don't have to rely on this super easy, oversimplified accounting ratio in order to try and gauge whether or not nonprofits are getting the work done that we need them to. It's a shortcut that, that we're using. So how do you fight nonprofit starvation? So first, acknowledge the necessity of overhead and total costs. I know some of you, there's already been way too much accounting talk already this morning. Just think, if you were having to do all of this, actually work with the numbers to turn over to the federal government that is controlling the funding, and then you get to go deliver services. Make sure that others have an accurate picture of your funding recipients, which may involve more time-intensive metrics. So the United Ways, the other organizations that are putting together this labor-intensive actual measure of collective impact, fund them too, because we have to get that information. And having that information is what is going to decrease our dependence on that accounting ratio. Third, know the comparative metrics of other organizations. So we can wish for data all we want. We go back to the computer today, we're still going to be left with the 990. So you have to use the accounting ratio. And a lot of my work is in financial management, so I love a good accounting ratio. <laughs> then look at other organizations that deliver similar services to the organization that you're looking at. And at least use benchmarking like Charity Navigator started to. Because then we're not evaluating everyone up against the mythical zero number. We're looking at whether or not organizations are, by looking at kind of a group, it's our best guess at what it might take to actually run those organizations. Now keep in mind that it's probably underreporting, people are trying to look skinny, they probably need more, but it's definitely better than using zero as a benchmark. And then finally, educate other funders and the broader public on what it takes to actually deliver services. There are a lot of y'all here. Like, this is fun. But I bet that you know people that also give to charities that are not in this room. Work it into the next conversation. The next time you hear someone say that someone's overhead rate is too high, or you hear uh, an advertisement or a solicitation where someone says that 100% of your donation goes to the program, the first thing that you think should be One, it's unlikely unless it's an accounting kind of shuffle where someone else has funded all of the overhead and so 100% of my donation is, is going to something. But the second thought should be, why do they feel compelled to say this? You shouldn't be ashamed that you're running a functional organization. And so this is a well-known example of photo doctrine. I know nowadays, and you know, with the internet and, and everything, this is a little bit more commonplace. But this was back in um, gosh, the 90s, 2000s, where you had a supermodel who is already pretty, pretty slim. Was not slim enough for Ralph Lauren, who doctored the, her image into something that was not only unhealthily skinny, but literally impossible. And that's really what we're asking nonprofits to do when we base our giving decisions on the overhead rate. So let's stop idealizing that and start thinking about giving money to support healthy size organizations. Thank you so much. I would love to answer any questions that you have about this or anything else that this may have caused you to think about. So thank you so much for having me.